Chapter Five, Part Two of the Complete Book of Cheese. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham. The Complete Book of Cheese by Robert Carlton Brown. Chapter Five, Part Two. Sixty-five Sizzling Rabbits. Yale College Welsh Rabbit, Moriarty's. One jigger of beer, one quarter teaspoon salt, one quarter teaspoon black pepper, one quarter teaspoon mustard, one and one half cups grated or shaved cheese, more beer. Pour the jigger of beer into a low saucepan, dash on the seasonings, add the cheese, and stir unremittingly, moistening from time to time with more beer. A pony or two at a time. When creamy, pour over buttered toast, two slices for this amount, and serve with still more beer. There are two schools of postgraduate rabbit hunters, Yale as above, with beer both in the rabbit and with it, and the other featured in the Stiff recipe, which prefers leaving it out of the rabbit, but taps a keg to drink with it. The ancient age of Moriarty's campus classic is registered by the use of pioneer black pepper in place of white, which is often used today and is thought more sophisticated by some than the red cayenne of Rector's naughty nineties chafing dish rabbit, which is precisely the same as our basic recipe number one. Border hopping bunny, or for holy rabbit. One and a half tablespoons butter, one and a half tablespoons chopped onion, two tablespoons chopped pepper, green or red, or both, one and one half teaspoon chili powder, one small can kidney beans drained, one and one half tablespoons ketchup, half teaspoon Worcestershire, salt, two cups grated cheese. Cook onion and pepper lightly in butter with chili powder. Add kidney beans and seasonings and stir in the cheese until melted. Serve this beanie bunny peppery hot on tortillas or crackers, toasted and buttered. In the whole hutch of kitchen rabbitry, the most popular modern ones are made with tomato, a little or lots. They hop in from everywhere, from Mexico to South Africa, and call for all kinds of quirks, down to mixing in some dried beef, and there is even a skimpy tomato rabbit for reducers, made with farmer cheese and skimmed milk. Although the quaintly named Rum Tum Tiddy was doubtless the great-grandpappy of all tomato rabbits, a richer, more buttery, and more eggy one has taken its place as the standard today. The following is a typical recipe for this, tried and true, since it has had a successful run through a score of the best modern cookbooks, with only slight personal changes to keep its juice a flowing blood red. Tomato Rabbit 2 tablespoons butter 2 tablespoons flour 3 quarter cup thin cream or evaporated milk three-quarter cup canned tomato pulp, rubbed through a sieve to remove seeds, a pinch of soda, three cups grated cheese, pinches of dry mustard, salt, and cayenne, two eggs lightly beaten. Blend flour in melted butter, add cream slowly, and when this white sauce is a little thick, stir in tomato sprinkled with soda. Keep stirring steadily while adding cheese and seasonings, and when cooked enough, Stir in the eggs to make a creamy texture, smooth as silk. Serve on buttered whole wheat or graham bread for a change. Instead of soda, some antiquated recipes call for a tablespoon of bicarbonate of potash. South African Tomato Rabbit This is the same as above, except that half teaspoon of sugar is used in place of the soda, and the rabbit is poured over baked pastry cut into squares, and sprinkled with parsley chopped fine, put in the oven, and served immediately. Rum tum tiddy, rink tum diddy, etc. Old Boston style. One tablespoon butter, one onion minced, one teaspoon salt, one big pinch of pepper, two cups cooked tomatoes, one tablespoon sugar, three cups grated store cheese, one egg lightly beaten. Slowly fry onion bright golden in butter. Season and add tomatoes with sugar. Heat just under the bubbling point. Don't let it boil, but keep adding cheese and shaking the pan until it melts. Then stir in egg gently and serve very hot. 
Tomato Soup Rabbit 1 can condensed tomato soup 2 cups grated cheese 1 quarter teaspoon English mustard 1 egg lightly beaten Salt and pepper Heat soup, stir in cheese until melted Add mustard and egg slowly Season and serve hot This is a quickie rum tum tiddy without any onion a poor housebroken version of the original it can be called celery rabbit if you use a can of celery soup in place of the tomato onion rum tum tiddy prepare as in rum tum tiddy but use only one and a half cups cooked tomatoes and add half cup of mashed boiled onions sherry rum tum tiddy one tablespoon butter one small onion minced one small green pepper minced one can tomato soup three-quarter cup milk three cups grated cheese one half teaspoon worcestershire sauce salt and pepper one egg lightly beaten one jigger sherry crackers prepare as in rum tum tiddy stir in the sherry last to retain its flavor crumble crackers into a hot tureen until it's about one-third full and pour the hot rum tum tiddy over them blushing bunny this is a sister under the skin to the old-fashioned rum tum tiddy except that her complexion is made a little rosier with a lot of paprika in place of plain pepper and the paprika cooked in from the start of course blushing bunny is one of those playful english names for dishes like pink poodle scotch woodcock given below bubble and squeak bubblem squeakum and toad in the hole scotch woodcock another variant of rum tum tiddy make your rum tum tiddy but before finishing up with the beaten egg stir in two heaping tablespoons of anchovy paste and prepare the buttered toast by laying on slices of hard-cooked eggs american woodchuck one and one half cups tomato puree two cups grated cheese one egg lightly beaten cayenne one tablespoon brown sugar salt and pepper heat the tomato and stir in the cheese when partly melted stir in the egg and when almost cooked Add seasonings without ever interrupting the stirring. Pour over hot toasted crackers or bread. No doubt this all-American tomato rabbit with brown sugar was named after the native woodchuck, in playful imitation of the Scotch woodcock above. It's the only rabbit we know that's sweetened with brown sugar. Running Rabbit, as served at the Waldorf Astoria First Annual Cheeslers Field Day, November 12, 1937. Cut finest old American cheese in very small pieces and melt in saucepan with a little good beer. Season and add Worcestershire sauce. Serve instantly with freshly made toast. This running coney can be poured over toast like any other rabbit, or over crushed crackers in a hot tureen, as in sherry rum tum tiddy, or served like fondue in the original cooking bowl or pan, with the spoon kept moving in it in one direction only, and the rabbit following the spoon like a greyhound following the stuffed rabbit at the dog races mexican chilele one tablespoon butter three tablespoons chopped green pepper one and one half tablespoons chopped onion one cup chopped and drained canned tomatoes without seeds two and one half cups grated cheese three quarter teaspoon salt dash of cayenne one egg lightly beaten two tablespoons canned tomato juice watercress Cook pepper and onion lightly in butter. Add tomato pulp and cook five minutes before putting over boiling water and stirring steadily as you add cheese and seasonings. Moisten the egg with the tomato juice and stir in until the rabbit is thick and velvety. Serve on toast and dress with watercress. This popular modern rabbit seems to be a twin to rum tum tiddy in spite of the century's difference in age. Fluffy eggy rabbit. Stir up a chilele as above but use two well-beaten eggs to make it more fluffy and leave out the watercress. Serve it hot over cold slices of hard-cooked eggs crowded flat on hot buttered toast to make it extra eggy. Grilled Tomato Rabbit Slice big red juicy tomatoes, half inch thick. Season with salt, pepper, and plenty of brown sugar. Dot both sides with all the butter that won't slip off. Heat in moderate oven, and when almost cooked, remove and broil on both sides. Put on hot plates in place of the usual toast and pour the rabbit over them. The rabbit is made according to either basic recipe number one or number two. Slices of crisp bacon on top of the tomato slices and a touch of horseradish help. 
grilled tomato and onion rabbit. Slice quarter inch thick, an equal number of tomato and onion rings. Season with salt, pepper, brown sugar, and dots of butter. Heat in moderate oven, and when almost cooked, remove and broil lightly. On hot plates, lay first the onion rings, top with the tomato ones, and pour the rabbit over, as in the plain grilled tomato recipe above. For another onion-flavored rabbit, see celery and onion rabbit. The Devil's Own, a fresh tomato variant. Two tablespoons butter, one large peeled tomato in four thick slices. Two and a half cups grated cheese. One quarter teaspoon English mustard. A pinch of cayenne. A dash of Tabasco sauce. Two tablespoons chili sauce. One half cup ale or beer. One egg, lightly beaten. Saute tomato slices lightly on both sides in one tablespoon butter. Keep warm on hot platter while you make the toast and a basic rabbit pepped up by the extra hot seasonings listed above. Put hot tomato slices on hot toast on hot plates. Pour the hot mixture over. Dried beef or chipped beef rabbit. One tablespoon butter, one cup canned tomato, drained, chopped, and deseeded, one quarter pound dried beef, shredded, two eggs, lightly beaten, one quarter teaspoon pepper, two cups grated cheese. Heat tomato in butter, add beef and eggs, stir until mixed well, then sprinkle with pepper, stir in the grated cheese until smooth and creamy, serve on toast. No salt is needed on this jerked steer meat that is called both dried beef and chipped beef on this side of the border, tasajo on the other side, and zarque when you get all the way down to Brazil. Kansas Jack Rabbit 1 cup milk 3 tablespoons butter 3 tablespoons flour 2 cups grated cheese 1 cup cream-style corn Salt and pepper Make a white sauce of milk, butter, and flour and stir in cheese steadily and gradually until melted. Add corn and season to taste. Serve on hot buttered toast. Kansas has plenty of the makings for this, yet the dish must have been easier to make on Baron Munchausen's Island of Cheese, where the cornstalks produce loaves of bread ready-made instead of ears, and were no doubt crossed with long-eared jacks to produce corn rabbits quite as miraculous. After tomatoes in popularity, Come onions and then green peppers or canned pimentos as vegetable ingredients in modern Americanized rabbits. And after that, corn, as in the following recipe, which appeals to all Latin Americans from Mexico to Chile, because it has everything. Latin American Corn Rabbit 2 tablespoons butter 1 green pepper, chopped 1 large onion, chopped 1 half cup condensed tomato soup 3 cups grated cheese 1 teaspoon salt, 1 quarter teaspoon black pepper, 1 half teaspoon Worcestershire sauce, 1 cup canned corn, 1 egg lightly beaten. Fry pepper and onion 5 minutes in butter. Add soup. Cover and cook 5 minutes more. Pour over boiling water. Add cheese with seasonings and stir steadily, slowly adding the corn, and when thoroughly blended and creamy, moisten the egg with a little of the liquid, stir in until thickened, and then pour over hot toaster crackers. Mushroom Tomato Rabbit In one pan commence frying in butter one cup of sliced fresh mushrooms, and in another make a rabbit by melting over boiling water, two cups of grated cheese with one half teaspoon salt, and one half teaspoon paprika. Stir steadily, and when partially melted, stir in a can of condensed tomato soup previously heated. Then add the fried mushrooms slowly, stir until creamy, and pour over hot toaster crackers. Celery and onion rabbit. One half cup chopped hearts of celery. One small onion, chopped. One tablespoon butter. One and one half cups grated sharp cheese. Salt and pepper. In a separate pan, boil celery and onion until tender. Meanwhile, melt cheese with butter and seasonings and stir steadily. When nearly done, stir the celery and onion in gradually until smooth and creamy. Or over buttered toast, and brown with a salamander or under the grill. Asparagus Rabbit Make as above, substituting a cupful of tender sliced asparagus tops for the celery and onions. Oyster Rabbit Two dozen oysters and their liquor. One teaspoon butter. Two eggs lightly beaten. One large pinch of salt. One small pinch of cayenne. Three cups grated cheese. 
Heat oysters until edges curl, and put aside to keep warm while you proceed to stir up a rabbit. When cheese is melted, add the eggs with some of the oyster liquor and keep stirring. When the rabbit has thickened to a smooth cream, drop in the warm oysters to heat a little more, and serve on hot buttered toast. Seafood Rabbits Crab, Lobster, Shrimp, Scallops, Clams, Mussels, Abalone, Squid, Octopi, anything that swims in the sea or crawls on the bottom of the ocean. Shred, flake, or mince a cupful of any freshly cooked or canned seafood and save some of the liquor, if any. Make according to Oyster Rabbit recipe above. Instead of using only one kind of seafood, try several, mixed according to taste. Spike this succulent sea rabbit with horseradish or a dollop of sherry for a change. Bouquet of the Sea Rabbit the seafaring Portuguese set the style for this lush bouquet of as many different kinds of cooked fish, tuna, cod, salmon, etc., as can be sardined together in the whirlpool of melted cheese in the chafing dish. They also accent it with tidbits of seafood as above. Other fish rabbit, fresh or dried. Any cooked fresh fish, flaked and shredded, from the alewife to the whale, or cooked dried herring, fin and haddie, mackerel, cod, and so on, can be stirred in to make a basic rabbit more tasty. Happy combinations are hit upon in mixing leftovers of several kinds by the cupful. So the odd old cookbook direction, add a cup of fish, takes on new meaning. Grilled sardine rabbit. Make a basic rabbit and pour it over sardines, skinned, boned, halved, and grilled, on buttered toast. Similarly, cooked fillets of any small fish will make a succulent a grilled rabbit. Roe rabbits. Sliced cooked roe of shad, or toothsome eggs of other fish, grill on toast, butter well, and pour a basic rabbit over. Although shad roe is esteemed the finest, there are many other sapid ones of salmon, herring, flounder, cod, etc. Plain sardine rabbit. Make basic rabbit with only two cups of cheese, and in place of the egg yolks and beer, stir in a large tin of sardines, skinned, boned, and flaked. Anchovy rabbit. Make basic rabbit. Add one tablespoon of imported East Indian chutney with the egg yolks and beer at the finish. Spread toast thickly with anchovy paste and butter, and pour the rabbit over. Smoked sturgeon, whiting, eel, smoked salmon, and the like. Lay cold slices or flakes of any fine smoked fish, and all of them are fine, on hot buttered toast, and pour a basic rabbit over the fish. The best combination we ever tasted is made by laying a thin slice of smoked salmon over a thick one of smoked sturgeon. Smoked Cheddar Rabbit With or without smoked fish, rabbit hunters whose palates crave the savor of a wisp of smoke, go for the basic rabbit made with smoked cheddar in place of the usual aged but unsmoked cheddar. We use a two-year-old that Phil Alpert, Mr. Cheese himself, brings down from Canada and has specially smoked in the same savory room where sturgeon is getting the works. So his cheddar absorbs the deluxe flavor of six dollar per pound sturgeon and is sold for a fraction of that. And just in case you are fishing around for something extra special, serve this smoky rabbit on oven-browned Bombay ducks, those crunchy flat toasts of East Indian fish. Or go oriental by accompanying this with cups of smoky Lapsang Souchong China tea. Crumby Rabbit One tablespoon butter, two cups grated cheese, one cup stale bread crumbs soaked with one cup milk, one egg lightly beaten, salt, cayenne, toasted crackers. Melt cheese in butter. Stir in the soaked crumbs and seasonings. When cooked smooth and creamy, stir in the egg to thicken the mixture, and serve on toasted crackers, dry or buttered, for contrast with the bread. Some rabbiteers monkey with this, lacing it with half a cup of ketchup, making a sort of pink baboon out of what should be a white monkey. There is a cult for crumby rabbits, variations on which extend all the way to a deep casserole dish called baked rabbit, and consisting of alternate layers of stale bread crumbs and grated cheese crumbs. This illegitimate three-layer rabbit is moistened with eggs beaten up with milk and seasoned with salt and paprika. Crumby Tomato Rabbit Two teaspoons butter, two cups grated cheese, one half cup soft bread crumbs, one cup tomato soup, salt and pepper, one egg lightly beaten. Melt cheese in butter, 
moisten bread crumbs with the tomato soup and stir in, season, add egg, and keep stirring until velvety. Serve on toasted crackers as a contrast to the bread crumbs. Gherkin or Irish Rabbit 2 tablespoons butter, 2 cups grated cheese, 1 half cup milk or beer, a dash of vinegar, 1 half teaspoon mustard, salt and pepper, 1 half cup chopped gherkin pickles. Melt cheese in butter. Steadily stir in liquid and seasonings. Keep stirring until smooth, then add the pickles and serve. This may have been called Irish after the green of the pickle. Dutch Rabbit Melt thin slices of any good cooking cheese in a heavy skillet with a little butter, prepared mustard, and a splash of beer. Have ready some slices of toast soaked in hot beer or ale and pour the rabbit over them. The temperance version of this substitutes milk for beer and delicately soaks the toast in hot water instead. Proof that there is no Anglo-Saxon influence here lies in the use of prepared mustard. The English, who still do a lot of things the hard way, mix their biting dry mustard fresh with water before every meal, while the Germans and French bottle theirs as we do. Pumpernickel Rabbit This German derivation is made exactly the same as the Dutch rabbit above, but its ingredients are the opposite in color. Black bread, pumpernickel, slices are soaked in heated dark beer, porter or stout, and the yellow cheese melted in the skillet is also stirred up with brunette beer. Since beer is a kind of liquid bread, it is natural for the two to commingle in rabbits whether they are blonde Dutch or black pumpernickel. And since cheese is only solid milk, and the cheddar is noted for its beery smell, there is further affinity here. An old English proverb sums it up neatly. Bread and cheese are the two targets against death. By the way, the word pumpernickel is said to have been coined when Napoleon tasted his first black bread in Germany. Contemptuously, he spat it out with, This would be good for my horse Nicole, bon pour Nicole, in French. Gruyere Welsh Rabbit au gratin. Cut crusts from half a dozen slices of bread. Toast them lightly, lay in a roasting pan, and top each with a matching slice of imported Gruyere three-eighths inch thick. Pepper to taste, and cover with bread crumbs. Put in oven ten minutes, and rush to the ultimate consumer. To our American ears, anything au gratin suggests with cheese. So this rabbit au gratin may sound redundant. To a Frenchman, however, it means a dish covered with bread crumbs. Swiss Cheese Rabbit One half cup white wine, preferably Neufchatel. One half cup grated Gruyere. One teaspoon Worcestershire sauce. One half salt spoon paprika. Two egg yolks. Stir wine and seasonings together with cheese until it melts. Then thicken with the egg yolks, stirring at least three more minutes until smooth. Sherry Rabbit Three cups grated cheese, one half cup cream or evaporated milk, one half cup sherry, one quarter teaspoon English mustard, one half teaspoon Worcestershire sauce, a dash of paprika. Heat cheese over hot water, with or without a bit of butter, and when it begins to melt, stir in the cream. Keep stirring until almost all of the cheese is melted, then add sherry. When smooth and creamy, stir in the mustard and Worcestershire sauce, and after pouring over buttered toast, dash with paprika for color. Spanish Sherry Rabbit 3 tablespoons butter, 3 tablespoons flour, 1 bouillon cube mashed, 1 half teaspoon salt, 1 half teaspoon dry mustard, 1 and 1 half cups milk, 1 and 1 half cups grated cheese, 1 jigger sherry. Make a smooth paste of butter, flour, bouillon cube, and seasonings, and add milk slowly. When well heated, stir in the cheese gradually. Continue stirring at least ten minutes, and when well blended, stir in the sherry and serve on hot buttered toast. Pink Poodle 2 tablespoons butter 1 tablespoon chopped onion 1 tablespoon flour 1 jigger California claret 1 cup cream of tomato soup A pinch of soda 1 half teaspoon dry mustard 1 half teaspoon salt 1 teaspoon paprika a dash of powdered cloves, three cups grated cheese, one egg lightly beaten. Cook onion and butter until light golden, then blend in flour, wine, and soup with the soda and all seasonings. Stir in cheese slowly until melted, 
and finish off by thickening with the egg and stirring until smooth and velvety. Serve on crisp, buttered toast with dry red wine. Although wine rabbits, red or white, are as unusual as Swiss ones with Gruyere in place of cheddar, wine is commonly drunk with anything from a golden buck to a blushing bunny. But for most of us, a deep draught of beer or ale goes best with an even deeper draught of the mellow scent of a cheddar golden yellow. Savory Eggy Dry Rabbit 1 eighth pound butter 2 cups grated Gruyere 4 eggs well beaten Salt, pepper, mustard Melt butter and cheese together with the beaten eggs, stirring steadily with wooden spoon until soft and smooth. Season and pour over dry toast. This dry rabbit, in which the volume of eggs makes up for any lacking liquid, is still served as a savory after the sweets to finish a fine meal in some old-fashioned English homes and hostelries. Cream Cheese Rabbit This rabbit, made with a package of cream cheese, is more scrambled hen fruit than rabbit food, for you simply scramble a half dozen eggs with buttermilk, salt, pepper, and cayenne, and just before the finish, work in the cheese until smooth and serve on crackers. Water crackers for a change. Reducing Rarebit Tomato Rarebit Footnote A From the Low Calorie Cookbook By Bernard Coton Published by Random House End footnote Yield Two servings 235 calories per serving one half pound farmer cheese, two eggs, one level tablespoon powdered milk, one level tablespoon baking powder, one teaspoon gelatin or agar powder, four egg tomatoes quartered, or two tomatoes quartered, one teaspoon caraway seeds, one quarter teaspoon garlic powder, one teaspoon parsley flakes, one half head lettuce and or one cucumber, one quarter cup wine vinegar, salt and pepper to taste fill bottom of double boiler with water to three-quarter mark sprinkle salt in upper part of double boiler boil over medium flame when upper part is hot put in cheese powdered milk baking powder gelatin caraway seeds and pepper and garlic powder to taste mix break eggs into this mixture cook over low flame continually stirring Add tomatoes when mixture bubbles and continue cooking and stirring until tomatoes have been cooked soft. Remove to lettuce and or cucumber, slice thin, which has been slightly marinated in wine vinegar, and sprinkle the parsley flakes over the top of the mixture. Curry Rabbit 1 tablespoon cornstarch, 2 cups milk, 2 and 1 half cups grated cheese, 1 tablespoon minced chives, 2 green onions minced, two shallots minced, one quarter teaspoon imported curry powder, one tablespoon chutney sauce. Dissolve cornstarch in a little of the milk and scald the rest over hot water. Thicken with cornstarch mixture and stir in the cheese, chives, onions, shallots, curry, and chutney while wooden spooning steadily until smooth and sizzling enough to pour over buttered toast. People who can't let well enough alone put cornstarch in rabbits just as they add soda to spoil the cooking of vegetables. Ginger Ale Rabbit Simply substitute ginger ale for the real thing in the number one rabbit of all time. Buttermilk Rabbit Substitute buttermilk for plain milk in the number two rabbit. To be consistent, use fresh cured buttermilk cheese instead of the usual cheddar of fresh cow's milk. This is milder. Eggnog Rabbit Two tablespoons sweet butter. Two cups grated mellow cheddar. 1 and 1 third cups eggnog, dashes of spice to taste. After melting the cheese in butter, stir in the eggnog and keep stirring until smooth and thickened. Season or not, depending on taste and the quality of the eggnog employed. Ever since the innovation of bottled eggnogs fresh from the milkman in holiday season, such supremely creamy and flavorful rabbits have been multiplying as fast as guinea pigs. All-American Succotash Rabbit 1 cup milk 3 tablespoons butter 3 tablespoons flour 3 cups grated cheese 1 cup creamed succotash Strained Salt and pepper Make a white sauce of milk, butter, and flour and stir in the cheese steadily and gradually until melted. Add the cream succotash and season to taste. Serve on toasted buttered cornbread. Danish Rabbit 1 quart warm milk 
two cups grated cheese. Stir together to boiling point and pour over piping hot toast in heated bowl. This is an esteemed breakfast dish in North Denmark. As in all rabbits, more or less cheese may be used to taste. Easy English Rabbit Soak bread slices in hot beer. Melt thin slices of cheese with butter in iron frying pan. Stir in a few spoonfuls of beer and a bit of prepared mustard. When smoothly melted, pour over the piping hot beer-soaked toast. End of Chapter 5, Part 2 Recording by Patty Cunningham Of the Complete Book of Cheese This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny The Complete Book of Cheese by Robert Carlton Brown Chapter 6 The Fondue There is a conspiracy among the dictionary makers to take the heart out of the fondue. Webster makes it seem no better than a collapsed souffle with his definition, fondue, also, erroneously, fondue, without the e. A dish made of melted cheese, butter, eggs, and often milk and bread crumbs. Thorndike Barnhart further demotes this dish, that for centuries has been one of the world's greatest, to a combination of melted cheese, eggs, and butter and explains that the name comes from the French fondre, meaning melt. The latest snub is delivered by the up-to-date Cook's Quiz, compiled by TV culinary experts. A baked dish with eggs, cheese, butter, milk, and breadcrumbs. A baked dish, indeed! Yet the fondue has added to the gaiety and inebriety of nations, if not of dictionaries, it has commended the respect of the culinary great. Savarin Boulestin, André Simon, all have hailed its heavenly consistency, all have been regaled with its creamy, nay, velvety smoothness. A touch of garlic, a dash of kirsch, fresh ground black pepper, nutmeg, black pearl truffles of bouguet, red cayenne pepper, the luscious gravy of roast turkey, such little matters help to make an authentic dunking fondue, not a baked fondue, mind you. jean Antin Priya Savarin, a century and a half ago, brought the original receipt with him and spread it around with characteristic generosity during the two years of his exile in New York after the French Revolution. In his monumental Physiologie du Goût, he records an incident that occurred in 1795. Whilst passing through Boston, I taught the restaurant keeper Julien to make a fondue, or eggs cooked with cheese. This dish, a novelty to the Americans, became so much the rage that he, Julien, felt himself obliged, by way of thanks, to send me to New York the rump of one of those pretty little roebucks that are brought from Canada in winter, and which was declared exquisite by the chosen committee whom I convoked for the occasion. As the great French gourmet, Savarin was born on the Swiss border, at Belly, in the fertile province of Bouguet, where Gertrude Stein later had a summer home. He no doubt ate Gruyère three times a day, as is the custom in Switzerland and adjacent parts. He sets down the recipe just as he got it from its Swiss source, the papers of Monsieur Troyer, in the neighboring canton of Berne. Take as many eggs as you wish to use, according to the number of your guests. Then take a lump of good Gruyère cheese, weighing about a third of the eggs, and a nut of butter about half the weight of the cheese. Since today's eggs in America weigh about one and a half ounces apiece, if you start the fondue with eight, your lump of good Gruyère would come to a fourth of a pound, and your butter to an eighth of a pound. Break and beat the eggs well in a flat pan. Then, Add the butter and the cheese, grated or cut in small pieces. Place the pan on a good fire and stir with a wooden spoon until the mixture is fairly thick and soft. Put in a little or no salt, 
according to the age of the cheese, and a good deal of pepper, for this is one of the special attributes of this ancient dish. Let it be placed on the table in a hot dish, and, if some of the best wines be produced, and the bottle passed quite freely, a marvelous effect will be beheld. This has long been quoted as the proper way to make the national dish of Switzerland. Savarin tells of hearing oldsters in his district laugh over the Bishop of Bali eating his fondue with a spoon instead of the traditional fork in the first decade of the 1700s. He tells, too, of a fondue party he threw for a couple of his septuagenarian cousins in Paris about the year 1801. The party was the result of much friendly taunting of the master. By Jove, Jean, you have been bragging for such a long time about your fondues, you have continually made our mouths water. It is high time to put a stop to all this. We will come and breakfast with you some day, and see what sort of thing this dish is. Savarin invited them for ten o'clock next day, started them off with the table laid on a snow-white cloth, and in each one's place two dozen oysters with a bright golden lemon. At each end of the table stood a bottle of sauterne, carefully white, excepting the cork, which showed distinctly that it had been in the cellar for a long while. After the oysters, which were quite fresh, came some broiled kidneys, a terrine of foie gras, a pie with truffles, and finally the fondue. The different ingredients had all been assembled in a stew pan, which was placed on the table over a chaffing dish, heated with spirits of wine. Then, Savarin is quoted, I commenced operations on the field of battle, and my cousins did not lose a single one of my movements. They were loud in the praise of this preparation, and asked me to let them have the receipt, which I promised them. This fondue breakfast party that gave the nineteenth century such a good start was polished off with fruits in season and sweets, a cup of genuine mocha, and finally two sorts of liqueurs, one a spirit for cleansing and the other an oil for softening. This primitive Swiss cheese fondue is now prepared more elaborately in what is called Neufchâtel style. Two and a half cups grated imported Swiss. One and a half tablespoons flour. One clove of garlic. One cup dry white wine. Crusty French flute or hard rolls cut into big mouthfuls, handy for dunking. One jigger kirsch. Salt. Pepper. Nutmeg. The cheese should be shredded or grated coarsely, and mixed well with the flour. Use a chaffing dish for cooking, and a small heated casserole for serving. Hub the bottom and sides of the blazer well with garlic. Pour in the wine and heat to bubbling, just under boiling. Add cheese slowly, half a cup at a time, and stir steadily in one direction only, as in making Welsh rabbit. Use a silver fork. Season with very little salt, always depending on how salty the cheese is, but use plenty of black pepper, freshly ground, and a touch of nutmeg. Then pour in the kirsch, stir steadily, and invite guests to dunk their fork bread in the dish or in a smaller preheated casserole over a low electric or alcohol burner on the dining table. The trick is to keep the bubbling melted cheese in rhythmic motion with the fork, both up and down and around and around. The dunkers stab the hunks of crusty French bread through the soft part to secure a firm hold in the crust, for if your bread comes off in dunking, you pay a forfeit, often a bottle of wine. The dunking is done as rhythmically as the stirring guests taking regular turns at twirling the fork to keep the cheese swirling. When this chaffing dish cheese custard, as it has been called in England, is ready for eating, each in turn thrusts in his fork, sops up a mouthful with the bread for a sponge, and gives the fondue a final stir to keep it always moving in the same direction. All the while the heat beneath the dish keeps it gently bubbling. Such a Neufchâtel party was a favorite of King Edward the Seventh, especially when he was stepping out as the Prince of Wales. He was as fond of fondue as most of the great gourmets of his day, and preferred it to Welsh rabbit, perhaps because of the wine and kirsch that went into it. 
At such a party, a little heated wine is added if the fondue gets too thick. When finally it has cooked down to a crust in the bottom of the dish, this is forked out by the host and divided among the guests as a very special dividend. Any dry white wine will serve in a pinch, and the Switzerland Cheese Association, in broadcasting this classical recipe, points out that any dry rum, slivovitz, or brandy, including applejack, will be a valid substitute for the kirsch. To us, applejack seems specially suited when we stop to consider our native taste that has married apple pie to cheese since pioneer times. In culinary usage, fondue means melting to an edible consistency, and this, of course, doesn't refer to cheese alone, although we use it chiefly for that. In France, fondue is also the common name for a simple dish of eggs scrambled with grated cheese and butter, and served very hot on toasted bread, or filled into fancy paper cases, quickly browned on top and served at once. The reason for this is that all baked fondues fall as easily as far as souffles, although the latter are more noted for this failing. There is a similarity in the soft fluffiness of both, although the fondues are always more moist, for there is a stiff, stuffed shirt build-up around any souffle, suggesting a dressy dinner, while fondue started as a self-service dunking bowl. Our modern tendency is to try to make over the original French fondue on the Welsh rabbit model, to turn it into a sort of French rabbit, although we know that both Cuillère and Emmentaler are what we call Swiss, and that it is impossible in America to duplicate the rich alpine flavor given by the mountain herbs, we are inclined to try all sorts of domestic cheeses and mixtures thereof. But it's best to stick to Savarin's lump of Cuillère, just as the neighboring French and Italians do. It is interesting to note that this Swiss alpine cooking has become so international that it is credited to Italy in the following description we reprint from When Madame Cooks by an Englishman, Eric Weir. Fondue à l'Italienne This is one of those egg dishes that makes one feel really grateful to hens. From its name, it originated probably in Italy, but it has crossed the Alps. I have often met it in France, but only once in Italy. First of all, make a very stiff white sauce with butter, flour, and milk. The sauce should be stiff enough to allow the wooden spoon to stand upright, or almost. Off the fire, add yolks of egg and four ounces of grated Gruyere cheese. Mix this in well with the white sauce and season with salt, pepper, and some grated nutmeg. Beat whites of egg firm. Add the whites to the preparation. Stir in and pour into a pudding basin. Take a large saucepan and fill half full of water. Bring to a boil and then place the pudding basin so that the top of the basin is well out of the water. Allow to boil gently for one and a half to two hours. Renew the boiling water from time to time as it evaporates and take care that the water, in boiling, does not bubble over the mixture. Test with a knife, as for a cake, to see if it is cooked. When the knife comes out clean, take the basin out of the water and turn the fondue out on a dish. It should be fairly firm and keep the shape of the basin. Sprinkle with some finely chopped ham and serve hot. The imported Swiss sometimes is cubed instead of grated, then marinated for four or five hours in dry white wine, before being melted and liquored with the schnapps. This can be pleasantly adopted here in All American Fondue. One pound imported Swiss cheese cubed. Three quarters of a cup scuppernong or other American white wine. One and a half jiggers applejack. After marinating the Swiss cubes in the wine, simply melt together over hot water. Stir until soft and creamy. Add the applejack and dunk with fingers of toast or your own to a chorus of all bound round with a woolen string. Of course, this can be treated as a mere vinous Welsh rabbit and poured over toast to be accompanied by beer. But wine is the thing, for the French fondue is to dry wine what the rabbit is to stale ale or fresh beer. 
We say French instead of Swiss, because the French took over the dish so eagerly, together with the great Gruyere that makes it distinctive. They internationalized it, sent it around the world with bouillabaisse and onion soup, that celestial soup à l'ouillon on which snowy showers of grated Gruyere descend. To put the Welsh rabbit in its place, they call it fondue à l'anglais, which also points up the twin-like relationship of the world's two favorite dishes of melted cheese. But to differentiate and show they are not identical twins, the number one dish remained fromage fondue, while the second was baptized fromage fondue à la bière. Beginning with Savarin, the French whisked up more rapturous, rhapsodic writings about Gruyère and its offspring, the fondue, together with the puffed souffle, than about any other imported cheese except Parmesan. Parmesan and Gruyère were praised as the two greatest culinary cheeses. A variant fondue was made of the Italian cheese. Parmesan fondue. Three tablespoons butter. One cup grated Parmesan cheese. Four eggs, lightly beaten. Salt. Pepper. Over boiling water, melt butter and cheese slowly. Stir in the eggs, season to taste, and stir steadily in one direction only until smooth. Pour over fingers of buttered toast, or spoon it up as the ancients did before there were any forks. It's beaten with a fork, but eaten catch as catch can, like chicken in the rough. Sapsago Swiss Fondue 2 tablespoons butter 2 tablespoons flour half teaspoon salt 1 and a half cups of milk 2 and a half cups of shredded Swiss cheese 2 and a half tablespoons of grated sapsago half a cup of dry white wine pepper, black and red, freshly ground fingers of toast over boiling water Stir the first four ingredients into a smooth, fairly thick cream sauce. Then stir in Swiss cheese until well melted. After that, add the sapsago, finely grated, and wine in small splashes. Stir steadily, in one direction only, until velvety. Season sharply with the contrasting peppers, and serve over fingers of toast. This is also nice, when served bubbling in individual preheated pastry shells, casseroles, or rankins, although this way most of the fun of the dunking party is left out. To make up for it, however, cooked slices of mushrooms are sometimes added. At the cheese cellar in the New York World's Fair Swiss Pavilion, where a continual dunking party was in progress, thousands of amateurs learned such basic things as not to overcook the fondue lest it become stringy, and the protocol of dunking in turn and keeping the mass in continual motion until the next on the fondue line dips in his cube of bread. The success of the dish depends on making it quickly, keeping it gently a bubble, and never letting it stand still for a split second. The Swiss, who consume three or four times as much cheese per capita as we, and almost twice as much as the French, are willing to share fondue honors with the French Alpine province of Savoy, a natural cheese cellar with almost two dozen distinctive types of its very own, such as fat cheese, also called Death's Head, La Grande Borna, a luscious half-dried ship's milker, Chevrotin, small, dry goat milk cheeses, and Mevacherin. The latter, made in both Savoy and Switzerland, boasts two interesting variants. Vacherin fondue, or spiced fondue, made about the same as Emmentaler, ripened to sharp age and then melted, spices added, and the cheese reformed. It is also called spiced fondue, and sells for about two dollars a pound, named fondue from being melted, though it's really recooked. Vacherin à la main. This is a curiosity in cheeses, resembling a cold, uncooked fondue, made of cow's milk, it is round, a foot in diameter, and half a foot high. It is salted and aged until the rind is hard, and the inside more runny than the ripest camembert, so it can be eaten with a spoon, like the cooked fondue, as well as spread on bread. The local name for it is Tom de Montaigne. Here is a good assortment of fondues. 
Vacherin Fribourg fondue. Two tablespoons butter. One clove of garlic, crushed. Two cups of shredded Vacherin cheese. Two tablespoons of hot water. This authentic quickie is started by cooking the garlic in butter until the butter is melted. Then remove garlic and reduce heat. Add the soft cheese and stir with silver fork until smooth and velvety. Add the water in little splashes, stirring constantly in one direction. Dunk. In this melted Swiss, a little water takes the place of a lot of wine. La Fondue Comtois This regional specialty of Franche Comté is made with white wine. Sauterne, Chablis, Riesling, or any Rhenish type will serve splendidly. Also, use butter, grated gruyere, beaten eggs, and that touch of garlic. Chive fondue. Three cups of grated Swiss cheese. Three tablespoons of flour. Two tablespoons of butter. One garlic clove, crushed. Three tablespoons of finely chopped chives. One cup of dry white wine. Salt. Freshly ground pepper. A pinch of nutmeg. A fourth of a cup of kirsch. Mix cheese and flour. Melt butter in chaffing dish blazer rubbed with garlic. Cook chives and butter for one minute. Add wine and heat just under boiling. Keep simmering as you add cheese and flour mix gradually, stirring always in one direction. Salt according to age and sharpness of cheese. Add plenty of freshly ground pepper and the pinch of nutmeg. When everything is stirred smooth and bubbling, Toss in the kirsch without missing a stroke of the fork and get to dunking. Large, crisp, hot potato chips make a pleasant change for dunking purposes. Or try assorted crackers alternating with the absorbent bread or hard rolls. Tomato Fondue Two tomatoes, skinned, seeded, and chopped. Half a teaspoon of dried sweet basil. One clove of garlic. Two tablespoons of butter. Half a cup of dry white wine. Two cups of grated cheddar cheese. Paprika. Mix basil with chopped tomatoes. Rub chaffing dish with garlic, melt butter, add tomatoes and much paprika. Cook five to six minutes. Add wine. Stir steadily to boiling point. Then add cheese, half a cup at a time and keep stirring until everything is smooth. Serve on hot toast like Welsh rabbit. Here, the two most popular melted cheese dishes tangle, but they're held together with the common ingredient, tomato. Fondue also appears as a sauce to pour over baked tomatoes. Stale breadcrumbs are soaked in tomato juice to make tomato baked fondue. One cup of tomato juice, one cup of stale bread crumbs, one cup of grated sharp American cheese, one tablespoon of melted butter, salt, four eggs separated and well beaten. Soak crumbs in tomato juice, stir cheese in butter until melted, season with a little or no salt, depending on saltiness of the cheese. Mix in the beaten yolks, fold in the white, and bake about 50 minutes in moderate oven. Baked fondues. Although Savarin's dunking fondue was first to make a sensation on these shores and is still in highest esteem among epicures, the fondue America took to its bosom was baked. The original recipe came from the supercasius province of Savoy under the explicit title La Fondue au Fromage. La Fondue au Fromage Make the usual creamy mixture of butter, flour, milk, yolks of eggs, and gruyere in thin slices for a change. Use red pepper instead of black. Splash in a jigger of kirsch but no white wine. Finally, fold in the egg whites and bake in a mold for 45 minutes. We adapted this to our national taste, which had already based the whole business of melted cheese on the Welsh rabbit with stale ale or milk, instead of white wine in Worcestershire, mustard and hot peppers. Today we have come up with this 
a hundred percent American fondue. Two cups of scalded milk. Two cups of stale bread crumbs. Half a teaspoon of dry English mustard. Salt. Dash of nutmeg. Dash of pepper. Two cups of American cheese. Cheddar. Two egg yolks well beaten. Two egg whites beaten stiff. Soak crumbs and milk. Season and stir in the cheese until melted. Add the beaten egg yolks and stir until you have a smooth mixture. Let this cool while beating the whites stiff, leaving them slightly moist. Fold the whites into the cool, custardy mix and bake in a buttered dish until firm, about 50 minutes in a moderate oven. This is more of a baked cheese job than a true fondue to our way of thinking and the scalded milk doesn't exactly take the place of the wine or kirsch. It is characteristic of our bland cookery. Other fondues, plain and fancy, baked and not. Quickie ketchup tummy fondue. Three quarters of a pound of sharp cheese diced. One can of condensed tomato soup. Half a cup of ketchup. Half a teaspoon of mustard. One egg lightly beaten. In double boiler, melt cheese in soup. Blend thoroughly by constant stirring. Remove from heat, lightly whip or fold in the ketchup and mustard mixed with eggs. Serve on melba toast or rusks. This might be suggested as a novel midnight snack with a cup of cocoa for a change. Cheese and rice fondue. One cup of cooked rice, two cups of milk. Four eggs, separated and well beaten. Half a cup of grated cheese. Half a teaspoon of salt. Cayenne, Worcestershire sauce or Tabasco sauce, or all three. Heat rice, instead of breadcrumbs, and milk. Stir in cheese until melted. Add egg yolks, beaten lemon yellow. Season. Fold in stiff egg whites. Serve hot on toast. Corn and cheese fondue. One cup of bread crumbs, one large can of cream corn, one small onion chopped, half a green pepper chopped, two cups of cottage cheese, half a teaspoon of salt, half a cup of milk, two eggs well beaten. Mix all ingredients together and bake in buttered casserole set in pan of hot water. Bake about one hour in moderate oven or until set. Cheese fondue. One cup of grated cheddar, half a cup of crumbled roquefort, one cup of pimento cheese, three tablespoons of cream, three tablespoons of butter, one teaspoon of Worcestershire. Stir everything together over hot water until smooth and creamy. Then whisk until fluffy moistening with more cream or mayonnaise if too stiff. Serve on Melba toast or assorted thin toasted crackers. Brick fondue. Half a cup of butter. Two cups of grated brick cheese. Half a cup of warm milk. Half a teaspoon of salt. Two eggs. Melt butter and cheese together. Use wire whisk to whip in the warm milk. Season. Take from fire and beat in the eggs, one at a time. Please note that fondue protocol calls for each egg to be beaten separately in cases like this. Serve over hot toast or crackers. Cheddar Dunk Bowl Three-fourths of a pound of sharp cheddar cheese. Three tablespoons of cream. Two thirds of teaspoon of dry mustard, one and a half teaspoons of Worcestershire. Grate the cheese powdery fine and mash it together with the cream until fluffy. Season and serve in a beautiful bowl for dunking in the original style of Savarin, although this is a static imitation of the real thing. All kinds of crackers and colorful dips can be used from celery stalks and potato chips to thin petals cut from Bombay duck. End of chapter 6 
Garden of the Complete Book of Cheese. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Book of Cheeses by Robert Carlton Brown. Chapter 7 Souffles, Puffs, and Ramekins. There isn't much difference between cheese souffles, puffs, and ramekins. The English Encyclopedia of Practical Cookery, the oldest, biggest, and best of such works in English, lumps cheese puffs and ramekins together, giving the same recipes for both, although it treats each extensively under its own name when not made with cheese. Cheese was the basis of the original French ramekin, cheese and bread crumbs or puff paste baked in a mould with puff again the principal factor in souffle from the french souffleur puff up basic souffle three tablespoons butter or margarine four tablespoons flour one and a quarter cups hot milk scalded one teaspoon salt a dash of cayenne a half cup of grated cheddar cheese, sharp, two egg yolks, beaten lemon yellow, two egg whites, beaten stiff. Melt butter, stir in flour and milk gradually until thick and smooth. Season and add the cheese, continuing the cooking and slow stirring until velvety. Remove from heat and let cool somewhat. Then stir in the egg yolks with a light hand and an upward motion. Fold in the stiff whites, and when evenly mixed, pour into a big round baking dish. Some butter it, and some don't. To make sure the top will be even when baked, run a spoon or knife around the surface, about one inch from the edge of the dish, before baking, slowly in a moderate oven until puffed high and beautifully browned. Serve instantly, for fear the souffle may fall. The baking takes up to an hour, and the egg whites shouldn't be beaten so stiff they are hard to fold in and contain no air to expand and puff up the dish. To perk up the seasonings, mustard, Worcestershire sauce, Lemon juice, nutmeg, and even garlic are often used to taste, especially in England. While cheddar is the preferred cheese, parmesan runs in a close second. Then comes Swiss. You may use any two or all three of these together. Sometimes roquefort is added, as in the ramekin recipes below. Parmesan souffle Make the same as basic souffle with these small modifications in the ingredients. One full cup of grated parmesan, one extra egg in place of the one-half cup of cheddar cheese, a little more butter, black pepper, not cayenne. Swiss souffle. Make the same as basic souffle with these slight changes. One and one quarter cups grated Swiss cheese instead of the cheddar cheese, nutmeg in place of the cayenne. Parmesan Swiss souffle. Make the same as basic souffle with these little differences one half cup grated Swiss cheese and one half cup grated Parmesan in place of the cheddar cheese. One quarter teaspoon each of sugar and black pepper for seasoning. Any of these makes a light, lovely luncheon or a proper climax to a grand dinner. Cheese Corn Souffle Make as basic souffle, substituting for the scalded milk, one cup of sieved and strained juice from cream-style canned corn. Cheese Spinach Souffle Sauté one and a half cups of finely chopped drained spinach in butter with one teaspoon finely grained onion, and then whip it until light and fluffy. 
Mix well into the white sauce of the basic souffle before adding the cheese and following the rest of the recipe. Cheese Tomato Souffle Substitute hot tomato juice for the scalded milk. Cheese Seafood Souffle Add one and one half cups finely chopped or ground lobster, crab, shrimp, other seafood or mixture thereof, with any preferred seasoning added. Cheese Mushroom Souffle One and one half cups grated sharp cheddar, one cup cream of mushroom soup, paprika to taste, salt. Two egg yolks well beaten, two egg whites beaten stiff, two tablespoons chopped cooked bacon, two tablespoons sliced blanched almonds. Heat cheese with soup and paprika, adding the cheese gradually and stirring until smooth. Add salt and thicken the sauce with egg yolks, still stirring steadily, and finally fold in the whites. Sprinkle with bacon and almonds, and bake until golden brown and puffed high, about one hour. Cheese Potato Souffle Potato Puff Six potatoes, two onions, one tablespoon butter or margarine, one cup hot milk, three-quarter cup grated cheddar cheese, one teaspoon salt, a dash of pepper, two egg yolks, well beaten, two egg whites, beaten stiff, one-quarter cup grated cheddar cheese. Cook potatoes and onions together until tender and put through a ricer. Mix with all the other ingredients except the egg whites and the cheddar. Fold in the egg whites, mix thoroughly, and pour into a buttered baking dish. Sprinkle the one-quarter cup of cheddar on top and bake in moderate oven about one-half hour until golden brown and well puffed. Serve instantly. Variations of this popular souffle leave out the onion and simplify matters by using two cups of mashed potatoes, sometimes one tablespoon of ketchup and another of minced parsley is added to the mixture, or onion juice alone to take the place of the cooked onions, about a tablespoon, full or scant. The English in concocting such a potato puff or souffle are inclined to make it extra peppery, as they do most of their cheese souffles, with not only a dust of black pepper, but as much cayenne as may be stood on the face of a sixpence. Cheese fritter souffles. These combine ham with Parmesan cheese, and are even more delicately handled in the making than crepe Suzette. Puffs Three and one puffs One cup grated Swiss, one cup grated Parmesan, one cup cream, cheese, five eggs, lightly beaten, salt and pepper. Mix the cheeses into one mass moistened with the beaten eggs, splashed on at intervals. When thoroughly incorporated, put in ramekins, tiny tins, cups, or any sort of little mold of any shape. Bake in hot oven about ten minutes, until richly browned. Such miniature souffles serve as liaison officers for this entire section, since they are baked in ramekins, or ramequins from the french word for the small baking dish that holds only one portion these may be paper boxes usually round earthenware china pyrex of any attractive shape in which to bake or serve the puffs more commonly in america at least puffs are made without ramekin dishes as follows fried puffs two egg whites beaten stiff, one half cup grated cheese, 
one tablespoon flour, salt, paprika. Into the stiff egg whites fold the cheese, flour, and seasonings. When thoroughly mixed, pat into shape desired. Roll in crumbs and fry. Roquefort Puffs one eighth pound genuine French Roquefort, one egg white beaten stiff, eight crackers or two inch bread rounds. Cream the Roquefort, fold in the egg white, pile on crackers, and bake fifteen minutes in slow oven. The constant repetition of beaten stiff in these recipes may give the impression that the whites are badly beaten up but such is not the case. They are simply whipped to peaks and left moist and glistening as a teardrop, with a slight sad droop to them that shows there is still room for the air to expand and puff things up in cooking. Parmesan Puffs Make a spread of mayonnaise or other salad dressing with equal parts of imported parmesan, grated fine. Spread on a score or more of crackers in a roomy pan and broil a couple of minutes till they puff up golden brown. Use only the best parmesan, imported from Italy, or second best from Argentina, where the rich pampas grass and Italian settlers get together on excellent parmesan and romano. Never buy parmesan already grated. It quickly loses its flavor. Breakfast Puffs One cup flour, one cup milk, one quarter cup finely grated cheese, one egg lightly beaten, one half teaspoon salt. Mix all together to a smooth light batter and fill ramekins or cups half full. Then bake in quick oven until they are puffing over the top and golden brown. Danish Fondue Puffs One stale roll. One half cup boiling hot milk. Salt, pepper. Two cups freshly grated cheddar cheese. Four egg yolks, beaten lemon yellow. Four egg whites, beaten stiff. Soak, roll in boiling milk, and beat to a paste. Mix with cheese and egg yolks. When smooth and thickened, fold in the egg whites and fill ramekins, tins, cups, or paper forms, and slowly bake until puffed up and golden brown. New England Cheese Puffs One cup sifted flour, one teaspoon baking powder, one half teaspoon salt, one half teaspoon Hungarian paprika, one quarter teaspoon dry mustard, two egg yolks beaten lemon yellow, one half cup milk, one cup freshly grated cheddar cheese, two egg whites beaten stiff but not dry. Sift dry ingredients together, mix yolks with milk and stir in. Add cheese, and when thoroughly incorporated, fold in the egg whites to make a smooth batter. Drop from a big spoon onto hot, deep fat, and cook until well browned. Caraway seeds are sometimes added. Poppy seeds are also used, and either of these makes a snappier puff, especially tasty when served with soup. A few drops of Tabasco give this an extra tang. Cream Cheese Puffs One half pound cream cheese, one cup milk, four eggs, lightly beaten, a half teaspoon salt, one half teaspoon dry mustard. Soften cheese by heating over hot water. Remove from heat and add milk, eggs, and seasoning. Beat until well blended, then pour into custard cups, ramekins, or any other individual baking dishes that are attractive enough to serve the puffs in. Ramekins or ramekins. Some ramekin dishes 
are made so exquisitely that they may be collected like snuff-bottles. Ramekins are utterly French. Both the cooked puffs and the individual dishes in which they are baked. Essentially a cheese puff, this is also au gratin when topped with both cheese and browned bread crumbs. By a sort of poetic cook's license, the name is also applied to any kind of cake containing cheese and cooked in the identifying one portion ramekin. It is used chiefly in the plural, however, together with the name of the chief ingredient, such as chicken ramekins, and cheese ramekins one, two eggs, two tablespoons flour, one eighth pound butter melted, an eighth pound grated cheese, mix well and bake in individual molds for fifteen minutes. Cheese ramekins two, three tablespoons melted butter, one half teaspoon each salt and pepper, three quarter cup bread crumbs, one half cup grated cheese, two eggs lightly beaten, one and one half cups milk. Mix the first four dry ingredients together. Stir eggs into the milk and add. Stir to a smooth batter and bake in buttered ramekins standing in water in moderate oven. Serve piping hot, for like souffles and all associated puffs, the hot air will puff out of them quickly. Then they will sink and be inedible. Two ancient English recipes still going strong. Cheese ramekins, three. Grate one half pound of any dry rich cheese. Butter a dozen small paper cases or little boxes of stiff writing paper like souffle cases. Put a saucepan containing one half pint of water over the fire. Add two tablespoons of butter and when the water boils stir in one heaping tablespoon of flour. Beat the mixture until it shrinks away from the sides of the saucepan. Then stir in the grated cheese. Remove the paste thus made from the fire and let it partly cool. In the meantime, separate the yolks from the whites of three eggs and beat them until the yolks foam and the whites make a stiff froth. Put the mixture at once into the buttered paper cases, only half filling them, since they rise very high while being baked, with small slices of cheese, and bake in a moderate oven for about fifteen minutes. As soon as the puffs are done, put the cases on a hot dish, covered with a folded napkin, and serve very hot. The most popular cheese for ramekins has always been, and still is, Gruyere. But because the early English also adopted Italian Parmesan, that followed as a close second, and remains there today. Sharp cheddar makes tangy ramekins, as will be seen in this second oldster, for though it prescribes Gloucester and Cheshire, arf and arf, both are essentially cheddars. Gloucester has been called a glorified Cheshire, and the latter has long been known as a peculiarly rich and colorful elder brother of cheddar, described in Kennel Me Digby's Closet Opened, as a quick, fat, rich, well-tasted cheese. Cheese Ramekins 4 Scrape fine one quarter pound of Gloucester cheese and one quarter pound of Cheshire cheese. Beat this scraped cheese in a mortar with the yolks of four eggs, a quarter pound of fresh butter, and the crumbs of a French roll boiled in cream until soft. When all this is well mixed and pounded to a paste, add the beaten whites of four eggs. Should the paste seem too stiff, 
one or two tablespoons of sherry may be added. Put the paste into paper cases, and bake in a Dutch oven till nicely browned. The ramekins should be served very hot. Since both Gloucester cheese and Cheshire cheese are not easily come by even in London today, it would be hard to reproduce this in the States. So the best we can suggest is to use half and half of two of our own great cheddars, say half coon and half Wisconsin longhorn, or half Tillamook and half Herkimer County. For there's no doubt about it, contrasting cheeses tickle the taste buds, and as many as three different kinds put together make puffs all the more perfect. Ramekins a la Parisienne Two cups milk, one cup cream, one ounce salt butter, one tablespoon flour, a half cup grated gruyere, coarsely ground pepper, an atom of nutmeg, a soupçon of garlic, a light touch of powdered sugar, eight eggs separated. Boil milk and cream together, melt butter, mix in the flour, and stir over heat five minutes, adding the milk and cream mixture a little at a time. When thoroughly cooked, remove from heat and stir in cheese, seasonings, and the yolks of all eight eggs, well beaten, and the whites of two, even better beaten. When well mixed, fold in the remaining egg whites, stiffly beaten, until you have a batter as smooth and thick as cream. Pour this into ramekins of paper, porcelain, or earthenware, filling each about two-thirds full to allow for them to puff up as they bake in a very slow oven until golden brown, or a little less than twenty minutes. Le Ramequin Morésien This celebrated specialty of Franche Comté is described as a porridge of water, butter, seasoning, chopped garlic, and toast, thickened with minced gruyere, and served very hot. Several French provinces are known for distinctive individual puffs, usually served in the dainty fluted forms they are cooked in. In Jean d'Arc's Lorraine, for instance, there are the simply named Les Ramequines, made of flour, gruyere, and eggs. Swiss Roquefort Ramequins A quarter pound Swiss cheese, a quarter pound Roquefort cheese, a half pound butter, eight eggs separated, four breakfast rolls, crusts removed, one half cup cream. The batter is made in the usual way, with the soft insides of the rolls simmered in the cream and stirred in. The egg whites are folded in last, as always. The batter poured into ramekins, part full, and baked to a golden brown. Then they are served instantaneously, lest they fall. Puff Paste Ramekins Puff or other pastry is rolled out flat and sprinkled with fine, tasty cheese, or any cheese mixture, such as Parmesan, with Gruyere, and or Swiss Sapsego, for a piquant change, but in lesser quantity than the other cheeses used. Parmesan has long been the favorite for these. Fold paste into three layers, roll out again, and dust with more cheese, Fold once more and roll this out and cut in small fancy shapes to bake 10 to 15 minutes in a hot oven. Brushing with egg yolk before baking makes these ramekins shine. Frying pan ramekins. Melt two ounces of butter, let it cool a little, and then mix with one half pound of cheese. Fold in the whites of three eggs beaten stiff but not dry. Cover frying pan with buttered papers, 
put slices of bread on this and cover with the cheese mixture. Cook about five minutes, take it off, and brown it with a salamander. There are two schools of salamandering among turophiles. One holds that it toughens the cheese and makes it less digestible. The other that it's simply swell. Some of the latter addicts have special cheese branding irons made with their monograms to identify their creations, whether they be burned on the skins of Welsh rabbits or frying pan ramekins, salamandering with an iron that has a gay carnivalesque design can make a sort of harlequin ramekin. Casserole ramekin. Here is the Americanization of a French original. In a deep casserole lay alternate slices of white bread and Swiss cheese, with the cheese slices a bit bigger all round. Beat two eggs and two cups of milk, season with salt, and, of all things, nutmeg. Proceed to bake like individual ramekins. End of chapter 7 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Chapter 8 of The Complete Book of Cheese This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Complete Book of Cheese by Robert Carlton Brown. Chapter 8. Pizzas, Blintzes, Pastes, Cheesecakes, etc. No matter how big or hungry your family, you can always appease them with pizza. Pizza, the tomato pie of Sicily. Dough. One package yeast, dissolved in warm water. Two cups sifted flour. One teaspoon salt. Two tablespoons olive oil. Make dough of this. Knead twelve to twenty minutes. Pat into a ball, cover it tight, and let stand three hours in warm place until twice the size. Tomato paste. Three tablespoons olive oil, two large onions sliced thin, one can Italian tomato paste, eight to ten anchovy fillets cut small, half a teaspoon of oregano, salt, crushed chili pepper, two and a half cups water. In the oil, fry onion tender but not too brown. Stir in tomato paste and keep stirring three or four minutes. Season. Pour water over, and simmer slowly twenty-five to thirty minutes. Add anchovies when sauce is done. Cheese. Half cup grated Italian, Parmesan, Romano, or Pecorino, depending on your pocketbook. Procure a low, wide, and handsome tin pizza pan, or reasonable substitute, and grease well before spreading the well-raised dough half to three-quarters of an inch thick. Poke your fingertips haphazardly into the dough to make marks that will catch the sauce when you pour it on generously. Shake on parmesan or parmesan-type cheese and bake in a hot oven half an hour, then quarter of an hour more at lower heat until the pizza is golden brown. Cut in wedges like any other pie and serve. The proper pans come all tin and a yard wide, down to regular apple pie size but twelve-inch pans are the most popular. Miniature pizzas Miniature pizzas are split English muffins rubbed with garlic or onion and brushed with olive oil. Cover with tomato sauce and a slice of mozzarella cheese, anchovy, oregano and grated parmesan, and heat eight minutes. Italian Swiss Scalopini One pound paper-thin veal cutlets, half cup flour, half cup grated Swiss and Parmesan mixed, one egg yolk lightly beaten with water, butter, salt, paprika. 
moisten veal with egg and roll in flour mixed with cheese. Quickly brown, lower flame and cook four to five minutes till tender. Dust with paprika and salt. Neapolitan baked lasagna or stuffed noodles. One pound lasagna or other wide noodles. One and a half cups cooked thick tomato sauce with meat. Half a pound ricotta or cottage cheese. One pound mozzarella or American cheddar. Quarter pound grated parmesan, romano or pecorino. Salt. Pepper, preferably crushed red pods. A shaker filled with grated parmesan or reasonable substitute. Cook wide or broad noodles fifteen to twenty minutes in rapidly boiling salted water until tender but not soft, and drain. Pour half a cup of tomato sauce in baking dish or pan. Cover with about half of the noodles. Sprinkle with grated parmesan, a layer of sauce, a layer of mozzarella, and dabs of ricotta. Continue in this fashion, alternating layers and seasoning each, ending with a final spread of sauce, parmesan, and red pepper. Bake firm in moderate oven about fifteen minutes, and serve in wedges like pizza with canisters of grated parmesan, crushed red pepper pods, and more of the sauce to taste. Little Hats, Capelletti Freshly made and still moist Capelletti, little hats, contrived out of tasty paste, may be had in any little Italy macaroni shop. These may be stuffed sensationally in four different flavours with only two cheeses. Brown slices of chicken and ham separately in butter. Mince each very fine and divide in half to make four mixtures in equal amounts. Season these with salt, pepper, and nutmeg, and a binding of two parts egg yolk to one part egg white. With these meat mixtures you can make four different flavoured fillings. Ham and mozzarella chicken, and mozzarella ham and ricotta chicken, and ricotta. Fill the little hats alternately, so you'll have the same number of each different kind. Pinch edges tight together to keep the stuffings in while boiling fast for five minutes in chicken broth, or salted water if you must. Since these capelletti are only a pleasing form and shape of ravioli, they are served in the same way, on hot plates, with plain tomato sauce, and parmesan or reasonable substitute. If we count this final seasoning as an ingredient, this makes three cheeses, so that each of half a dozen taste buds can be getting individual sensations without letting the others know what it's doing. Dauphiny Ravioli This French variant of the famous Italian pockets of pastry follows the Capelletti pattern, with any fresh goat cheese and gruyere melted with butter and minced parsley and boiled in chicken broth. Italian Fritters Quarter of a cup flour Two tablespoons sugar Quarter pound fresh ricotta two eggs beaten, half cup shredded mozzarella, rind of half lemon grated, three tablespoons brandy, salt. Stir and mix well together in the order given, and let stand one hour or more to thicken the batter, so it will hold its shape while cooking. Shape batter like walnuts, and hold one at a time in the bowl of a long-handled spoon dipped for ten seconds in boiling hot oil. Fritter the walnuts so, and serve at once with powdered sugar. To make fascinating cheese croquettes, mix several contrasting cheeses in this batter. Italian asparagus and cheese. This gives great scope for contrasting cheeses in one and the same dish. In a shallow baking pan put a foundation layer of grated cheddar and a little butter. Cover with a layer of tender parts of asparagus, lightly salted. Next, a layer of grated gruyere with a bit of butter, and another of asparagus. From here you can go as far as you like, with varied layers of melting cheeses, alternating with asparagus, until you come to the top, where you add two more kinds of cheese, a mixture of powdered parmesan with sapsago, to give the new-mown hay scent. 
Garlic on cheese. For one sandwich, prepare thirty or forty garlic cloves by removing skins and frying out the fierce pungents in smoking olive oil. They skip in the hot pan like Mexican jumping beans. Toast one side of a thickish slice of bread. Put this side down on a grilling pan. Cover it with a slice of imported Swiss Emmentaler or Gruyere of about the same size, shape, and thickness. Stick the cooked garlic cloves, while still blistering hot, in a close pattern into the cheese, and brown for a minute under the grill. Salt lightly, and dash with paprika for the colour. Recipe by Bob Brown in Merle Armitage's collection Fit for a King. Spaniards call garlic cloves teeth. Englishmen call them toes. It was cheese and garlic together that inspired Shakespeare to Hotspur's declaration in King Henry the Fourth, I had rather live with cheese and garlic in a windmill far than feed on cates and have him talk to me in any summer-house in Christendom. Some people can take a mere soupçon of the stuff, while others can down it by the soup-spoon, so we feel it necessary in reprinting our recipe to point to the warning of another early English writer. Garlic is very dangerous to young children, fine women, and hot young men. Blintzes. This snow-white member of the crepe Suzette sorority is the most popular deb in New York's fancy cheese dishes set. Almost unknown here a decade or two ago, it has joined Blinis, Kreplach, and Cheeseburgers as a quick and sustaining lunch for office workers. Two eggs, one cup water, one cup sifted flour, salt, cooking oil, half pound cottage cheese, two tablespoons butter, two cups sour cream. Beat one egg light, and make a batter with the water, flour, and salt to taste. Heat a well-greased small frying pan, and make little pancakes with two tablespoons of batter each. Cook the cakes over low heat and on one side only. Slide each cake off on a white cloth, with the cooked side down. While these are cooling, make the blintz filling by beating together the second egg cottage cheese and butter. Spread each pancake thickly with the mixture, and roll or make into little pockets or envelopes, with the end tucked in to hold the filling. Cook in foil till golden brown, and serve at once with sufficient sour cream to smother them. Vatrushki Russia seems to have been the cradle of all sorts of blinis and blintzes, and perhaps the first of them to be made was vatrushki a variant of the blintzes above. The chief difference is that rounds of puff paste dough are used instead of the hot cakes. One teaspoon of sugar is added to the cottage cheese filling, and the sour cream, half a cup, is mixed into this instead of being served with it. Little cups filled with this mix are made by pinching the edges of the dough together. The tops are brushed with egg yolk and baked in a brisk oven. Cottage Cheese Pancakes One cup prepared pancake Four tablespoons top milk or light cream One teaspoon salt Four eggs well beaten One tablespoon sugar Two cups cottage cheese put through ricer Mix batter and stir in cheese last until smooth cheese waffles two cups prepared waffle flour three egg yolks lightly beaten quarter cup melted butter three quarters cup grated sharp cheddar three egg whites beaten stiff stir up a smooth waffle batter of the first four ingredients and fold in egg whites last today you can get imported canned holland cheese waffles to heat quickly and serve Napkin dumpling. One pound cottage cheese. One eighth pound butter, softened. Three eggs, beaten. Three quarters of a cup farina. Half teaspoon salt. Cinnamon and brown sugar. 
mix together all ingredients except the cinnamon and sugar to form a ball. Moisten a linen napkin with cold water and tie the ball of dough in it. Simmer forty to fifty minutes in salted boiling water, remove from napkin, sprinkle well with cinnamon and brown sugar, and serve. This is on the style of Hungarian potato and other succulent dumplings, and may be served with goulash or as a meal in itself. Butter and Cheese Where fish is scant and fruit of trees, supply that want with butter and cheese. Thomas Tusser in The Last Remedy Butter and cheese are mixed together in equal parts for cheese butter. Serbia has a cheese called butter that more or less matches Turkey's durak, of which butter is an indispensable ingredient, and French conquayot is based on sour milk simmered with butter. The English have a cheese called margarine made with the butter substitute. In Westphalia there are no two schools of thought about whether it is better to eat butter with cheese or not, for in Westphalia sour milk cheese butter is mixed in as part of the process of making. The Arabs press curds and butter together to store in vats, and the Scots have crowdy or cruddy butter. Buttermilk Cheese The value of buttermilk is stressed in an extravagant old Hindu proverb. A man may live without bread, but without buttermilk he dies. Cheese was made before butter being the earliest form of dairy manufacturing, so buttermilk cheese came well after plain milk cheese, even after whey cheese. It is very tasty and a natural with potato salad. The curd is salted after draining and sold in small parchment packages. German leather cheese has buttermilk mixed with the plain. The Danes make their appetitost with sour buttermilk. Ricotta Romano, for a novelty, is made of sheep buttermilk. Cottage Cheese In America, cottage cheese is also called pot, dutch, and smear case. It is the easiest and quickest to make of all cheeses by simply letting milk sour or adding buttermilk to curdle it, then stand a while on the back of the kitchen stove, since it is homemade as a rule. It is drained in a bag of cheesecloth, and may be eaten the same day, usually salted. The pilgrims brought along the following two tried and true recipes from Old England, and both are still in use and good repute. Cottage Cheese Number 1 Let milk sour until clotted. Pour boiling water over, and it will immediately curd. Stir well, and pour into a cullender. Pour a little cold water on the curd, salt it, and break it up attractively for serving. Cottage Cheese No. 2 A very rich and tasty variety is made of equal parts whole milk and buttermilk, heated together to just under the boiling point. Pour into a linen bag and let drain until next day. Then remove, salt to taste, and add a bit of butter or cream to make a smooth, creamy consistency, and pat into balls the size of a Seville orange. Cream Cheese In England there are three distinct manners of making cream cheese. 1. Fresh milk, strained and lightly drained. 2. Scalded cream, dried and drained dry, like Devonshire. 3. Rennet curd ripened, with thin edible rind or none, packaged in small blocks or miniature bricks by dairy companies, as in the U.S. Philadelphia cream cheese. American cream cheeses follow the English pattern, being named from their region or established brands owned by Breakstone, Borden, Kraft, Shefford, etc., Cream cheese such as the first listed above is easier to make than cottage cheese or any other. Technically, in fact, it is not a cheese, but the dried curd of milk, and is often called virginal. Fresh milk is simply strained through muslin in a perforated box, through which the whey and extra moisture drains away for three or four days, 
leaving a residue as firm as fresh butter. In America, where we mix cream cheese with everything, a popular assortment of twelve sold in New York bears these ingredients and names. Chives, cherry, garden, caviar, lax, pimiento, olive and pimiento, pineapple, relish, scallion, strawberry, and triple-decker of relish, pimiento, and cream in layers. In Italy there is stracchino cream, in Sweden chantilly. Finally, to come to France, la foncée, or fromage de peau, a cream also known around the world as crème d'isigny, double crème, fromage à la crème de gien, peau de crème Saint-Gervais, etc., etc. The French go even farther by eating thick, fresh cream with chevreton du Beaujolais and fromage blanc, in the style that adds à la crème to their already glorified names. The English came along with snow cream cheese that is more of a dessert, similar to Italian cream cheese. We'd like to have a cheese ice cream to contrast with two sweet ones. Attempts at this have been made, both here and in England. Scottish Caledonian cream came closest. We have frozen cheese with fruit, to be sure, but no true cheese ice cream as yet, though some cream cheeses seem especially suitable. The farmer's daughter hath soft brown hair, butter and eggs and a pound of cheese, and I met with a ballad I can't say where that wholly consisted of lines like these, butter and eggs and a pound of cheese. In this parody by Calverley, the farmer's daughter, the ingredients suggest cheesecake dating back to 1381 in England. From that year, Kettner, in his Book of the Table, quotes this recipe. Take cream of almonds or of cow milk and beat them well together and make small coffins, that is, cases of pastry, and do it, put it, therein, and do, put, thereto, sugar and good powders. Or take good fat cheese and eggs, and make them of divers colours, green, red, or yellow, and bake them, or serve them forth. This primitive receipt grew up into Richmond Maids of Honour, that caused Kettner to wax poetic with, At Richmond we are permitted to touch with our lips a countless number of these maids, light and airy as the airy fairy Lillian. What more can the finest poetry achieve in quickening the things of earth into tokens and foretastes of heaven, with glimpses of higher life and ethereal worlds? Cheesecakes Coronation Cheesecake The Oxford Dictionary defines cheesecake as a tartlet filled with sweet curds, etc. This shows that the cheese is the main thing, and the and-so-forth just a matter of taste. We are delighted to record that the Lord Mayor of London picked traditional cheese tarts, the maids of honour mentioned earlier in this section, as the coronation dessert with which to regale the second Queen Elizabeth at the city luncheon in Guildhall. This is most fitting, since these tarts were named after the maids of honour at the court of the first Queen Elizabeth. The original recipe is said to have sold for a thousand pounds. These Richmond maids of honour had the usual cheesecake ingredients, butter and eggs and pounds of cheese, but what made the subtle flavour? Nutmeg, brandy, lemon, orange flower water, or all four? More than two thousand years before this land of coronation cheesecake, the Greeks had a word for it, several in fact. Apician cheesecake, Aristoxenian and Philoxenian among them. Then the Romans took it over, and we read from an epistle of the period, Thirty times in this one year, Carinus, while you have been arranging to make your will, have I sent you cheesecakes dripping with Hyblaean thyme. 
celestial honey such as that of Mount Hymettus we still get from Greece. Plato mentioned cheesecake, and a town near Thebes was named for it before Christ was born, at a time when cheesecakes were widely known as dainty food for mortal man. Today cheesecakes come in a half-dozen popular styles, of which the ones flavoured with fresh pineapple are the most popular in New York. But buyers delight in every sort, including the 100% American type called cheese pies. Indeed, there seems to be no dividing line between cheese cakes and cheese pies. While most of them are sweet, some are made piquant with pimientos and olives. We offer a favourite of ours, made from popcorn-style pot cheese put through a sieve. Pineapple Cheesecake Two and a half pounds sieved pot cheese. One inch piece vanilla bean. Quarter pound sweet butter, melted. Half a small box graham crackers, crushed fine. Four eggs. Two cups sugar. One small can crushed pineapple, drained. Two cups milk. One third cup flour. In a big bowl, mix everything except the graham crackers and pineapple in the order given above. Butter a square pyrex pan and put in the graham cracker dust to make a crust. Cover this evenly with the pineapple, and pour in the cheese custard mixture. Bake one hour in a quiet oven, as the English used to say for a moderate one, and when done, set aside for twelve hours before eating. Because of the time and labour involved, maybe you had better buy your cheesecakes, even though some of the truly fine ones cost a dime a bite, especially the pedigreed Jewish-American ones in Manhattan. Rubens and Lindy's are two leaders at about five dollars a cake. Some are fruited with cherries or strawberries. Cheese Custard Four eggs, slightly beaten. Half a teaspoon salt. One cup milk. A dash of pepper or paprika. Three tablespoons melted butter, a few drops of onion juice if desired, four tablespoons grated Swiss, imported. Mix all together, set in moulds in pan of hot water, and bake until brown. Open faced cheese pie three eggs, one cup sugar, two pounds soft smear case. Whip everything together and fill two pie crusts. Bake without any upper crust. The Apple Pie Affinity Hot apple pie was always accompanied with cheese in New England, even as every slice of apple pie in Wisconsin has cheese for a sidekick, according to law. Pioneer hot pies were baked in brick ovens and flavoured with nutmeg, cinnamon and rose geranium. The cheese was cheddar, but today all sorts of pie and cheese combinations are common, such as banana pie and gorgonzola, mince with Danish blue, pumpkin with cream cheese, peach pie with hable, and even a green dusting of sapsago over raisin pie. Apple pie, au gratin, thickly grated over with parmesan, cacciocavallo, or sapsago, is something special when served with black coffee. Cider, too, or applejack, is a natural accompaniment to any dessert of apple with its cheese. Apple pie adorned. Apple pie is adorned with cream and cheese by pressing cream cheese through a ricer and folding in plenty of double cream, beaten thick and salted a little. Put the mixture in a pastry tube and decorate top of pie in fanciful fashion. Apple pie a la cheese Lay a slice of melting cheese on top of apple or any fruit or berry pie, and melt under broiler two to three minutes. Cheese crusty apple pie In making an apple pie, roll out the top crust, and sprinkle with sharp cheddar 
grated. Dot with butter and bake golden brown. Flan au fromage. To make this franche comte tart of crisp paste, simply mix coarsely grated gruyere with beaten egg, fill the tart cases and bake. For any cheese pastry or fruit and custard pie crusts, work in tasty shredded sharp cheddar in the ratio of one to four parts of flour. Christmas Cake Sandwiches A traditional Christmas carol begs for a little bit of spice cake, a little bit of cheese, a glass of cold water, a penny, if you please. For a festive handout, cut the spice cake or fruit cake in slices and sandwich them with slices of tasty cheese between. To maintain traditional Christmas cheer for the elders, serve apple pie with cheese and applejack. Angelic Camembert One ripe camembert, imported. One cup Anjou dry white wine. Half pound sweet butter, softened. Two tablespoons finely grated toast crumbs. Lightly scrape all crusty skin from the camembert, and when its creamy interior stands revealed, put it in a small round covered dish. Pour in the wine, Cover tightly so no bouquet or aroma can possibly escape, and let stand overnight. When ready to serve, drain off and discard any wine left. Dry the cheese, and mash with the sweet butter into an angelic paste. Reshape in original camembert form, dust thickly with the crumbs, and there you are. Such a delicate dessert is a favourite with the ladies, since some of them find a prime camembert a bit too strong if taken straight. Although A. W. Fulton's observation in For Men Only is going out of date, it is none the less amusing. Quote, in the course of a somewhat varied career, I have only met one woman who appreciated cheese. This quality in her seemed to me so deserving of reward that I did not hesitate to acquire her hand in marriage. End quote. Another writer has said that only gourmet among women seem to like cheese, except farm women and foreigners. The association between gourmet and farm women is borne out by the following urgent plea from early Italian landowners. Ai contadini non far sapere quante è buono il cacio con le pere. Don't let the peasants know how good are cheese and pears. Having found out for ourselves, we suggest a golden slice of taleggio, stracchino, or pale gold bel paese to polish off a good dinner with a juicy Lombardy pear or its American equivalent, a Bartlett, let us say. This celestial association of cheese and pears is further accented by the French. Entre la poire et le fromage, between the pear and the cheese. This places the cheese after the fruit as the last course, in accordance with early English usage set down by John Clarke in his Parimiologia. After cheese comes nothing. But in his epigrams, Ben Jonson serves them together. Digestive cheese and fruit there sure will be. That brings us back to cheese and pippins. I will make an end of my dinner. There's pippins and cheese to come. Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor When should the cheese be served? In England it is served before or after the fruit, with or without the port. Following the book of carving in modern spelling, we note when it was published in 1431, the proper thing, after meat, was pears, nuts, strawberries, whortleberries, American huckleberries, and hard cheese. In modern practice, we serve some suitable cheese like camembert directly on slices of apple and pears. Gorgonzola on sliced banana, hablé, spread on pineapple, 
and a cheese dessert tray to match the lazy loo, with everything crunchy down to cracker jacks. Good, too, are figs, both fresh and preserved, stuffed with cream cheese, kumquats, avocados, fruity dunking mixtures of pineapple cheese, served in the scooped-out cask of the cheese itself, and apple or pear and provolone, creamed and put back in the rind it came in. Pots of liquored and wined cheeses no end, those of your own making being the best. Champagne Roquefort or Gorgonzola Half a pound mellow Roquefort Quarter pound sweet butter, softened A dash cayenne Three quarters of a cup of champagne With a silver fork, mix cheese and butter to a smooth paste Moistening with champagne as you go along Using a little more or less champagne According to consistency desired Serve with the demitasse and cognac, offering, besides crackers, gilt gingerbread in the style of Holland Dutch cheese tasters, or just plain bread. After dinner cheeses suggested by Phil Alpert are From France, Port Salut, Roblochon, Coulommier, Camembert, Brie, Roquefort, Calvados. Try it with a spot of Calvados apple brandy. From the U.S., Liederkranz, Blue, Cheddar. From Sweden, Hable Crème Chantilly. From Italy, Taleggio, Gorgonzola, Provoloni, Bel Paese. From Hungary, Cascaval. From Switzerland, Swiss Gruyère. From Germany, Kümmelkäse. From Norway, Getost, Bondost. From Holland, Edam, Gouda. From England, Stilton. From Poland, Warszawski Sir. End of chapter 8